Oh, so many time zones. That's my most amazing. Wow. Oh. One in the morning in Europe. <laughs> Wow. Oh, hello. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Takes longer to see everybody. <laughs> so. Hello. <laughs> Oh, great. Great. Well, welcome everybody. For, um, for folks who are joining just for the Sunday sitting, just a reminder that um, we have been having a weekend meditation retreat. Um, so there's about 50 or 60 folks who are have been sitting all weekend um, as part of a month long offering that we've been doing on the Brahma Viharas, uh, the divine abodes. And so this weekend we've been practicing uh, mudita practice. It's gladness, uh, appreciation, appreciative joy, sympathetic joy, joy. Um, so there's the degree to which we've been successful is there's some light, light lightness in the heart. Um, and, uh, and of course, it's still it's yogi life. Uh, so sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easy. But we're happy to have you joining us for this um, towards the end of our time together. That's great. And then, so for folks who may be interested, who don't know about it yet, we're doing one more weekend, next weekend. Will and be this the, week, yeah. oh, right. But yeah. that people can still yeah. sign up for. Right, yeah. Uh, sure. Next weekend will be the Upeka uh, practice, the equanimity practice. Um, that we'll focus on, and that will be the sort of end of this month long period of practice. And for any Spanish speakers among you or friends you may know of, to know, Darine and I are going to be on Wednesday night offering what is now our kind of monthly uh, Dama in, in Espanol. Estamos llegando la luna llena. Every, we're trying to do it every full moon um, and, or around the full moon. So uh, if you know anyone else uh, who might be interested in that, you can let them know. And so um, we'll continue now with the, this practice of mudita and we're happy to um, bring the folks in who are just joining us for this part of the weekend program. So the invitation is, um, to, of course, get comfortable in your seated posture. Letting the eyes come to close. And spending a few moments just noticing where the attention is naturally called. In our baseline vipassana practice of mindfulness, there's such a powerful ethic of simply observing whatever sensations we may notice in the body. Whatever experiences we notice in the sense doors of seeing, hearing, 
smelling, tasting. And also the awareness of the mind, the activity of thinking and emotions, of knowing. We try to develop the ability to include all experiences in our tender observation. As many know, of course, we will normally bring the attention towards one particular aspect of the experience, maybe the breath at the abdomen or where the hands are touching. Maybe the sensations throughout the body or the stream of sound. Just to give ourselves a sense of anchoring in this flood of experience. Always changing, there's pleasant sensations and unpleasant sensations. Neutral sensations streaming by. And we have this ethic of trying to observe and understand them. watching them arise and pass on their own. And in our Brahma Vihara practice, we have been learning also the value of caring. Caring for the same stream of experience, the same spectrum of pleasure and pain, joy and sorrow. And we can feel that shift in the quality of attention from the simple observing to the connection of the worthiness of each moment of sound or each physical sensation of being cared for. Every thought that arises, every emotion that moves within us, We can bring this quality of tenderness of care as they arise and as they pass away. We also notice that the quality of care can be a little different depending on if it's a painful experience or a pleasant experience. So when there's unpleasant or uncomfortable sensations in the body, unpleasant experiences in the heart and mind, memories, worries, that this caring can have a flavor of compassion. We care about the hardship of pain. And remembering that it is a beautiful quality. It is a pleasant experience to care about pain.
we are careful not to exclude the unpleasant from the field of our heart's tenderness. We feel the goodness of that, the safety that that inspires. Feel the softening in the mind and in the body in regards to unpleasant sensations. And so we find the same possibility with a range of pleasant experiences. That there are good feelings in the body, pleasant feelings in the mind, good memories, happy memories, pleasant ideas, pleasant sounds and smells. And we can care about those as well. And the flavor of that caring is something like appreciation. We value the preciousness of happiness. any sensation on the skin, deep in the body. Any mental feeling that feels uplifting, we can bring this caring for, caring about our happiness, finding joy in our joy, appreciating the goodness in our life right now. And we can see the way this also strengthens the heart, it supports our sense of possibility, and strength, softness, tenderness. And to whatever degree we might feel a sense of appreciation, of gladness for any pleasant experiences, we can feel that in the mind. Receive the gladness. Notice if there's any sensations in the body that soften, that relax. in response. We also can recognize that all around us, in front of us, to our sides and behind us, above us and below us, In every direction, there are countless beings. And we know that their lives will have this wide range of joy and sorrow. We can practice caring for their hardship feeling that sense of connection, shared concern, and the beauty of it. But also we know that beings in every direction have happiness in their lives. There are beings enjoying a morsel of food 
beings giving gifts and feeling the joy of giving. Beings receiving gifts and feeling the joy of receiving. In all directions around us, there are beings enjoying each other's company, caring for and being cared for, feeding and being fed, playing, resting, learning together, encouraging one another. And we can feel glad about this. We can rejoice ourselves in the joy of all of these other beings. attuning to the sense of gladness for all the good that is in our lives, all of our lives, of all kinds of beings in all of the directions, human beings, animal beings, plant beings, spirit beings, insects, the microscopics, All beings know joy, know the experience of happiness and gladness. And when we appreciate it in our own hearts and minds, something of that barrier falls away so that it is a shared gladness. shared joy, shared delight and rejoicing. Caring about one another's happiness, sharing in that gladness. simply taking our time to consider the gladness in the world around us, not in denial of all the rest, but acknowledging the goodness and nourishing our own minds and our own bodies with that shared portion of all of the goodness in the world. Feeling that goodness and the gladdening that it brings. Feeling it in our own bodies, hearts and minds. And offering it. Offering this caring about happiness to all of the beings in the world around us deepening our own appreciation, attuning to all of the goodness in the world, letting it feed us as we feed the world with our mudita.
So this is just one approach of, of many, you know, some of which we've been exploring this, this weekend. I did want to offer, because it came up yesterday and <clears throat> a question, and I just wanted to say briefly about this practice in general, not just this method of this particular way of doing it, but someone asked about that, that, that it can be easier to sort of attune to parts of the body um, but it's sort of hard sometimes to find a connection to the mind if you're caring about the mind or find, trying to find a, a connection to a mental experience over time that it can be difficult. And so I just wanted to offer one thing about that, which is really important, has been important for me and others I know in terms of these Brahma Vihara practices in particular, but also for the Vipassana practice, because in the Vipassana, we start usually with the body and, and go to the the more insubstantial eventually in the mind and, and these subtle experiences unfolding in the mind. And part of what can be hard is that we treat the mind as sp spatial. We're trying to look for where where do I do it? And part of that's a habit because we're doing that with the body. The knee is down here, the head is up here. There's a spatial relationship to the body uh, appropriately or inappropriately. And so we try to do that same thing with the mind, whereas it's very difficult much of the time to find the mind in space because it isn't exactly anywhere in particular. Sometimes it feels like it's kind of back here or around, you know, just as a way, as a suggestion is to, to instead of looking for the mind somewhere that we look for it more in time, that it's really only happening in the present moment, right? Mind isn't happening elsewhere. And so that actually, it's very simple to just see it as a, time experience, um, uh, an experience in time versus an experience in space. Actually, that's true for the body as well, that we can have experiences on the realm, the range of that. But sometimes trying to tune into mudita as a temporal experience of the mind versus trying to find it in space can be helpful. So that's all. <laughs> so um, Steve will offer a talk now. And just to remind folks who are just here for the Sunday sitting, normally we would have a question and answer afterwards, but today we won't. We'll hear Steve's talk and then keep the container of silence for our weekend retreat. Oh, you gotta uh, unmute there, Steve, let's see. Okay. You can hear me? Yeah. Uh, I thought it would be helpful to bring wisdom or insight to the Mudita Brahma Vihara to understand it. As it's presented in the in the texts, it, it, its quality, characteristic, nature, function, manifestation is all. Its psychology is spelled out, um, and what's called its near and far enemy, which, as we have said, we that, that translation doesn't quite describe what's meant, like the near enemy. It could also be translated as a, the masquerade, what looks like that particular Brahma Vihara, but really is not. Um, and the far enemy, which is the exact opposite, the opposite of metta or unconditional love is anger, or ill will, irritation, aggression, and so forth. Uh, whereas it's near enemy or masquerade uh, is conditional, some form of conditional love or love with attachment. Uh, so th we did that with the metta Brahma Vihara. And I think we did that with the compassion of the Brahma Vihara as well. And I think along the way, we've actually mentioned the near and far enemies 
of, of mudita. But just to go into it a little bit more um, functionally today, you know, how it can apply to our practice, particularly uh, as things that came up in this morning's sitting and the following questions and answers. I thought it would be helpful. In some, in some places in the old ancient texts or discourses, even though the Brahma Viharas we can describe as one mind or one heart uh, with the four facets of metta, compassion, joy, equanimity, there, there is a, there's a certain logic to the order, to their order, uh, metta, being like a fundamental ground of connection, friendliness, um, feeling for the welfare of oneself and others. And then taking that heart, that tenderness and sensitivity of heart um, to where there's discord or pain or anxiety, any kind of dukkha or suffering and discovering that the, the, the genuine heart's response is this soft and sweet tone care or compassion. It's just, it's just nature. It's just what's happening. We're not constructing these qualities. We're trying to bring out their essence and their, their purity. Uh, so by, by studying what happens when there's attached love or um, something that looks like compassion, but really is a de some degree of sorrow or grief or pity, that understanding really helps bring out the genuine element of compassion. So for mudita, when we look at what's called the near enemy or the masquerade, of Murita. There's also an attachment there. Uh, and so in line with the order of these, metta, compassion, mudita, equanimity, the, the logic is, is that each, each one is a degree more challenging or difficult. You know, we often say that's, that's that an individual yogi, any of us might find that our doorway um, is, is mudita, you know, or our doorway is actually in, at, in the beginning of practice, could be even be equanimity, which has a neutral feeling tone. But generally our doorway is one of the first three because they have a pleasant feeling tone, metta, compassion, mudita. And though mudita may be more natural and feel like uh, our particular doorway uh, as opposed to metta or compassion, there is a logic in, in it being in that third order of, of challenge or difficulty. And that's because of the subtlety of attachment that we can easily miss. Uh, so generally they translate the near enemy of mudita as over exuberance. Uh, often we just say it's, it's a joy with attachment, joy with a hook. Um, and, and that's where we want to look a little more clearly and bring some wisdom insight to that because it's quite a, a subtle hook. And we, we may all of a sudden just feel slammed while doing the mudita and it disappears. And we're just sort of left feeling bereft, like what happened? And I had all this joy a moment ago, I can't get it back or the last sitting or yesterday or the last retreat. 
you know, where is it gone? The degree of reaction is often um, profoundly connected to the degree of attachment. That is the degree of reaction of, of feeling suddenly just slammed in the face or cut off or the rug pulled out, uh, you know, empty or having lost it um, is commensurate with the subtle degrees of attachment that can occur. Uh, the Buddha spoke of the second noble truth, tanha, as craving or ignorance and craving. Ignorance being not seeing clearly how things arise and pass, but missing the impermanent nature of things. But because we miss the impermanent nature of things, um, we grasp for our happiness in, the, in what's not permanent. Even as practice progresses and becomes more subtle in Vipassana, for example, and we, we're understanding uh, more and more clearly the anicca nature of experience or the dukkha uh, nature of experience, the instability uh, and fleeting nature, or the anatta nature that this uncontrollable and it's no way we or anyone can control our own or anyone's experience. We have that understanding to a certain degree. When we're practicing the Brahma Viharas, uh, actually as the way Upandita instructed me, you know, he, he said, hold on to the good feeling when it's there. In other words, he was telling me to be attached <laughs> in, a, in a way, um, but not with a tanha, not with a craving. He didn't mean in that way. It, it's, and this is where we might get confused. It's rather a very keen, firm focus on the meditation object. So the object of meditation here is mudita, is joy. Uh, the joy itself the quality of the joy, the manifestation, the emotion, uh, that characteristic, that joy in nature is the object of our meditation. Not the object of the joy. So that if, if we use our imagination, a conceptual imagination, for example, to, to kickstart this mudita stream in the heart, um, it's easy to hold on to what we think is bringing the joy, that being that we're imagining or that thing that we're imagining. Uh, and therefore we could be cultivating the, the tanha kind of holding on rather than just the meditative focus, staying with the meditation object. The, the real object is, is joy. The phrases, if we use them, are, are a tool, the way we use mental labeling at times in Vipassana. And what we imagine uh, that we, the image or the felt sense of the being that we use for metta or compassion or the mudita is, too, is also a tool, temporary tool borrowed for the time that it takes to start cultivating and, and, and sprouting the mudita until it blooms. And then we don't need those, those tools. But often it's confusing and, and we get tangled up in, in maybe too forcefully holding on to the phrase or phrases or holding on to the meditation uh, visualization the imagery we're using to nurture, to call up, to feed the murita. So uh, uh, because it's pleasant, because there's a pleasant feeling tone with the first three Brahma Viharas, what we may miss is attachment to that pleasant feeling tone. Um, so there's the native 
our natural joy of the mudita. And there's also the pleasant feeling tone that accompanies it. So it's sort of, you know, we are a double benefit there. The, the pleasant feeling tone that arises along with mudita because it's a pleasant emotion, just like a pleasant feeling tone accompanies compassion or care because it feels good to care. And with unconditional love, there's, there's no strings attached, there's no stickiness. Uh, and in the absence of that attachment, it's a pure, pleasant feeling tone. Because of the subtlety of, the, of this kind of inner joy, this mudita joy that is not dependent on sense joy, it's not dependent on anything, the environment around us feeding us directly through the eye or ear or body door or mind door, a pleasant experience. It's a non-sensual, beautiful joy, this mudita, this appreciative uh, delight that, that lifts up when we call it into being, when we call it forward. And, and along with that is the, is the pleasant feeling tone. If we're not aware for periods of time of the pleasant feeling tone, then that, that second noble truth of tanha, it, it, it grows more subtle. So just like in the Vipassana progression, as the mind gets real quiet and real subtle, and bodily phenomena, mental phenomena, uh, the visual spectrum, everything becomes incredibly light, soft, uh, more spectrum of colors, greater tones and timbers of sound that we don't ordinarily notice. It's beautiful. And that's what happens in, in Vipassana practice as well as Brahma Vihara practice. But sneaking along with it is, is, is this tanha that also grows more and more subtle if we're not shining our awareness on them. So, so bringing wisdom to investigate and see clearly how a mudita moment, our, our stream, how it manifests and along with it is the pleasant feeling tone is extremely helpful in, in, in de-hooking that subtle attachment, that subtle pleasure of that arises moment to moment with the murita. Uh, and it just takes seeing it, seeing the difference between a pleasant feeling tone and the attachment to that pleasure. But it's not the pleasantness of the feeling tone that's the problem, that's sticky, uh, that, that sidetracks our practice or makes it feel like we're suddenly slammed when it disappears. It's the attachment to that pleasure. So pleasant feeling tone is just that, it's pleasant. Mudita, because it's a, an emotion that in, is innately an inner dhamma joy, is, is, extra, is extra pleasant, you could say. And so the feeling tone itself would be quite pure and refined. And therefore easy for that subtle tanha or craving to, to stick to it. And we wouldn't see that at first. We just feel good. And it feels, it feels good to feel good when we're really abiding, basking in the love and kindness of metta, in the care of compassion, and in the appreciative, uplifting, rejoicing nature of, of mudita. It's very purifying as we were talking about this morning. Uh, and and of, of course, that, please, that pleasant feeling tone, we don't want it to go away. We want it to stay. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, 
we're not observant at times. We're not seeing the accompanying pleasant feeling zone. So it becomes, there's a reaction that takes place when we don't really see and understand the pleasant feeling tone. Sukha Vedana, Sukha uh, happy or pleasant Vedana feeling. So if we see it, there's no problem. If we miss it, then it can be a problem that stickiness can arise, that grasping, that wanting that's connected to the joy. So the joy is not the problem. The mudita is never the problem. And the pleasant feeling tone isn't the problem. Rather, it's the attachment that grows, identification and attachment that grows. When we see with that wisdom awareness, innate in that wisdom awareness is an understanding of in Nietzsche nature, impermanence is an understanding of anatta nature, that there's no one there to control. So it's a selfless understanding that immediately unhooks that attachment. And then it's just that pure, pleasant feeling tone alongside of this pure and beautiful emotion uh, called murita, rejoicing, or this uplifting, appreciative uh, happiness, delight in things that are beautiful, in, in people and living beings that are happy, in the goodness that we attune to in ourselves and in the world. So recognizing that when the mudita seems to be fading away or when we're trying to get it going, um, there can be a grasping. We want to get it because we've had a taste of it before. And once we have it, we want it to stay. And we don't see the attachment in that wanting. And, and that's where we can suddenly feel this despairing uh, sense of loss and rupture you know, to our system because we're fed, we're healed by these Brahma Viharas. It's like, it feels at times like we're receiving the nectar of the gods and goddesses, literally feels that way. We feel like we're, we're like grace, like we're being blessed with this God or goddess-like energy. It's so fulfilling and the heart feels so at home once that's experienced, one has that feeling, I've never felt more at home or more myself than this feeling, the, this Brahma Vihara or these Brahma Viharas. That's all legitimate and real and good and healing and growing for us, takes us further along the path Therefore, we want to really be adept and energetic and resolved to, to seeing the cracks and crannies where the attachment can lurk and, and suddenly come out and hold on and, and we don't see it. And therefore, we feel this deprivation and worthlessness when it goes away. What do we do? Well, for a while, if that, if that collision happens, uh, it can feel like this tectonic plate clash, and you know, this a real split, a real fault line a fracture. We can go back to a previous Brahma Vihara that we have felt profoundly connected to that we have previously abided in successfully and uh, rest there for a while. Or we can use the Vipassana to do as I'm describing here, to try and see and recognize if and when there is attachment arising, when, there's, when the liking becomes uh, a craving and attachment. And the very wisdom that sees that releases it. It immediately sees the impermanent nature of it. When 
I would get stuck in something like that in practice with Upandita, a typical instruction would be to make a resolve to only notice pleasant feeling tone for a few sessions, few practice sessions or a few days. So if I was, if you saw that I was really attached, you might say for the next three days, watch, just observe the Vedana, the feeling tone foundation, second foundation of mindfulness, body, feelings, mind, our consciousness, and all other phenomena. And so in doing that, and just paying attention to feeling tones, I could see how feeling tones, they're anicca nature. They arose and they fell away. And they're dukkha nature. Dukkha because they weren't permanent. They weren't reliable to hold on to, to keep being fed this nectar of the goddesses. And they're anatta nature that there is no one here with the ability to make that pleasant feeling stay. No control. On the other hand, if we look at the, the far enemy of mudita, um, often we might recognize it as in daily life, as when there's a, a strong desire or longing um, for what we perceive someone else to have, that we, we project our goodness onto them when we don't, when we lose connection with the goodness in ourselves. So the reason why it's the far enemy is because it usually manifests as envy and jealousy, the opposite of this rejoicing, this unconditional uh, appreciative joy that is purity of mudita. The, the, the envy and the jealousy are the opposite be, because we've lost touch for some moments or some time with our own gold within, our own beauty, our own goodness. And so then we perceive it to be out there in maybe in someone else. And we want that, there's this urge, usually unconscious to take it, to take that gold, to have that gold, to own that gold that we can never get because it's out there. And we've, our own sense of defi deficit is just because we're not in touch with our inner goodness or inner gold. So we project it as if it's out there in this other person. And that envy and jealousy actually rests on feelings of unworthiness, feelings of inadequacy, of not being good or not being good enough. So to bring wisdom to that, to understand what is meant here by the, the far enemy, the opposite of this joyous, uplifting purity of, of the heart's appreciation, the heart's release in appreciating happiness wherever we see it. To investigate the, the far enemy is to get in touch gradually with our own goodness and to abide knowing our own goodness. That's where the mudita takes us. That's where we are fed. That, that's where all the ways our, our sense of ourselves, a sense of our, the goodness of our being has felt fractured or split off. And here is where it's healed. Here is where it's again brought together. Uh, so to understand the pitfalls of attachment, <laughs> that that will get us in trouble. Uh, attachment to the pleasant feeling tone of mudita uh, and to investigate that and be released of that as well as to investigate the, the opposite, the far enemy, the envy and jealousy or perhaps despair is the emotion you feel. 
and see if you can sense any underlying sense of I'm not good enough, I can't do this, I'm, in, I'm inadequate, uh, and eventually touch those play places of I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy enough. Uh, and then the wisdom of that exploration uh, allows for those qualities, those difficult qualities to fall away and to touch into our worthiness. And then as we get back in, into the center of abiding in the pure mudita, we're, we're feeding that worthiness. We're cultivating, we're in touch with, and again, cultivating and being fed by our, our, our worthiness, our goodness, our value, just being alive, just being here. And then we, we understand how all the little ways we envious or jealous in the world. And we understand why uh, when we are feeling real good, why other people, sometimes energetically, we feel them pulling on us. And, and it's the same situation. They're not in touch with their own goodness, their own worthiness. Uh, they may see it. And, and want it and want to take it from you. If we have that understanding, we can work with that. If we don't, we, we don't know what's happening and we just feel our energy drained and the relationship strained, you know, or not happening at all. As we were saying this morning, the mudita experience does not have to be intense. We should lower our expectations or not even have any expectations of what it is to look like. We may have a huge projection that, you know, joy means this sort of cinema screen version of always being up, always kind of mainlining this quality of, of, of joyousness all the time. You know, not, not so at all. When we do bring wisdom to it, or when it's accompanied by its companions of caring and friendliness and equanimity, it's a, it can be a real chilled out stream of rejoicing nature, just leaning back on the worthiness, on the goodness that we feel. So for me, you know, after, since my stroke and as I'm practicing with you here, it's really simple things that cause delight. The, the, the green of the garden, the shape of the plants and flowers and, you know, uh, mango trees are my favorite. And I have a companion right here that I sit under or, or walk under uh, all the time. Uh, the color of the when the sky is clear of blue. Uh, so this colors, breezes, my ability to move about. Some days are easier than other others. Um, it's really a joyful day when like today, I can I can cross my left leg, I can sit like the yogi I've been for 45 years because it feels it just feels connected for me and I feel real centered uh, and I'm attached to it <laughs> and I know eventually I have to unhook from that uh, because no matter what our legs are aging and we won't always be able to sit cross-legged uh, um, when I had the hip replacement the surgeon said you'll never be able to sit cross-legged and, and so I, I was happy that I could after the hip replacement. That was seven years ago. And I, I'm guessing that my doc, doctor, even though he's Thai and they grow up sitting cross-legged, for some reason he can't sit cross-legged. <laughs> I, I don't know. But for me, it, it's one of the simple joys when like right now I can do this. And lastly, um, I was talking to Michelle earlier about 
my mom's passing uh, in about 14 years ago. And we were all together in the room. And I was holding, we were holding hands, my mom and I, and eye to eye contact. And I was uh, synchronizing my breath with hers. So it started to become a little hyped up at times. I would, I would, I would meet that and then slow down and she would slow down or if her breath got real slow, I'd meet that, that slow cadence and kind of lift it up just a little. And we just did that and did that. In this cocoon with all her best friends who were Michelle's and my best friends since she had outlived her own it was a cocoon of all the Brahma Viharas at once. The connection, the fundamental connection of metta and the pro profound care, of compassion. And just the mudita of the love shining between us in the eye contact and felt hand sense experience. And then the, uh, the overarching equanimity it sort of just held this powerful moment. Birth and death seem very close in moments like that. It seemed very similar uh, and, until her last breath, which felt like as much a birth as a mystery. And so too, our practice, like every breath, every moment of mudita and the other Brahma Viharas are precious. And uh, to think of them on that sort of continuum, as Jesse was saying, uh, time continuum or even a space time continuum that it's a complete and total mystery. And yet we are giving our full hearts to it, full trust. Uh, may you continue to abide in the Brahma Vihara Dhamma of the Metta, Karuna, the Mudita rejoicing in the stillness and stability and serenity of equanimity. Thank you for your practice. Take your time, connect with each other with uh, the mudita joy. Folks can feel free to write a, <clears throat> a message into the chat to everyone if you like as you depart. There's a sitting it for, for, the sit who are, for the folks who are continuing, you know, doing the weekend retreat, we'll get together again at the top of the hour for our final sitting. <laughs> Vancouver, Texas, Massachusetts. <laughs> Vancouver. Lots of cats today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the feline Sangha. May they be happy and bouncy and joyous. Yes, yeah. <laughs> They'll have their own Zoom room at some point. <laughs>
<laughs> and for the feral cats, do they get a Zoom room outside? <laughs> feral, feral cats are liberated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wow. Beautiful mm. beings. Kita from. From Mudita mm. beings. <laughs> Kyoto. Mm. Melbourne, California. Mm. New Mexico. <laughs> Not a Vancouver. Vancouver. Mm. Mm. I'm sorry. Feel their self. Sorry. We got our Kamasaka team. Kamasaka. <laughs> Next week. Next weekend. Kamasaka. Kamasaka is the phrase for equanimity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 